Hello. The title of this talk is Stuttering Treatment Within a Social Model of Disability, Resolving Contradictions and Double Messages. I'm Vivian Siskin. I'm a clinical professor in the Department of Hearing and Speech Sciences at the University of Maryland and owner of the Siskin Stuttering Center in McLean, Virginia. I'm delighted to talk today about the social model of disability and how we might, as clinicians and researchers, take a look at our treatment goals, our research questions, and the language we use so that there is congruency in our thinking and in our actions when it comes to our work with stutterers. I'll be focusing on contradictions in our rationales and double messages in our language. And as we all might be guilty of this, consider ways that we might have a little more cognitive consonants in our work. I'll start off by saying that I have nothing to disclose either financially or non-financially but I do have some disclaimers. First, I'm not an expert in disability studies. And there are plenty of people who are listening who can talk about the social model with greater depth and insight than I can. However, I do consider myself an expert in stuttering and autism. And we'll be talking about lessons I have learned from the intersection of stuttering and autism within the context of the social model. Next, I will be using both person-first language and identity-first language as I am aware that these are individual choices and currently I use them interchangeably as I am getting used to the value of both. So here's a little background. In 1989, disability advocates preferred to put the person before the disability or condition and describe what the person has, not the, what the person is. Person first language, person who stutters. Others do not want to separate the person from their identity and prefer identity first language, stutterer. Person centered language prioritizes the preferences of those who are being referred to. So it's an individual choice. From my perspective, the problem comes when an organization adopts one or the other. I presented an ASHA webinar on the lived experience of stuttering. And even though my content supported using identity first language, the slide editors at ASHA, yes, they have slide editors, protested saying that ASHA uses person for his language as a policy, but I stood my ground. I'd like to begin with some initial thoughts. For the first time in nearly 40 years, I'm optimistic about the state of treatment of stuttering. I spent most of my career as an outlier, encouraging my clients to value their stuttering but not their struggling, accept their identity, be proud of who they are and reduce their reactivity to a speech difference that has been stigmatized by society. But there was a good deal of resistance, not only within the profession, but from the stutterers themselves, their families, their teachers, their doctors. I was encouraged and still am to gift wrap my treatment outcomes so they appear to achieve fluency in addition to all of my other outcomes, comfort, confidence, spontaneity. What I was doing was not enough, not enough to measure outcomes according to the research community, not enough to get families on board, not enough to get funding, because society doesn't understand that a stutterer does not need to be fixed. My optimism? I'm invigorated by a new wave of young speech pathologists and stutterers who have the courage and momentum to embrace difference, organize to amplify their views, and to show the world that diversity, neurodiversity, is a part of the human experience. I am seeing publications like Stammering Pride and Prejudice and shout out to Patrick Campbell, Sam Simpson, and Chris Constantino, articles about microaggressions against stutterers, Thank you to Heather Grossman and Marco Malia for that. I'm watching from the outside an outspoken group of New York City stutterers who are making an impact. And I was trusted enough by the National Stuttering Association board to allow Chris Constantino and me to organize an interprofessional NSA research symposium examining stuttering within a social model of disability. Intersectionality, stuttering and autism was the focus. I'm not new to this. I don't stutter, but my family is touched daily by our difference. We can't blend in. We can't pass as a typical family. 
Some are surprised to hear that my husband, who stutters by the way, and I don't do some of the things that other couples and families do. We accept and value who we are as a family and we also made changes. Changes in our work schedules, we juggle a lot. Changes in where we live, we moved across the country not knowing a soul in our new community. Changes in what we find funny, we laughed aloud when I shook the hand of a famous astronomer for about 30 seconds as my husband blocked while introducing me to his colleague. And when a supermarket shopper gave me a bad mother look, when my autistic five-year-old had a public exhibition related to one of his enthusiasms, I smiled and said, oh, those are happy noises. You should see him when he's upset. As I begin to talk about the social model, where the problem is basically within society, not the individual, consider that we can embrace both acceptance and change in stuttering treatment from lessons learned. Um, correction there, from lessons learned through a cross disability perspective. Okay, I'm gonna start on this one again. Starting again, as I begin to talk about the social model where the problem is basically within society, not the individual, Consider that we can embrace both acceptance and change in stuttering treatment from lessons learned through a cross-disability perspective. So let's begin. As I talk about disability, consider that stuttering is considered a disability according to the Americans with Disabilities Act, hence my frequent reference to disability. The social model is often contrasted with the medical model. The medical model locates the disability in the individual's body or mind and seeks to fi fix the problem. The social model, on the other hand, locates the problem in society and seeks to fix society with political action. The medical model values overcoming barriers. The social model values reform. What might stuttering look like within these models? I took a stab at it. The blue text on the left and the right include treatment context. The medical model might include IEP teams, speech therapy, drugs, devices, specialists, insurance. The social model might include prejudice, stigma, discrimination, ignorance, and lack of useful therapy. So I think you can see where I'm going here. I'm suggesting that we can place useful speech therapy into the social model and end up with useful speech therapy on both sides of this graphic. I suppose we can say if there were no stigma, there would be no reactivity. Perhaps, but not so easy to do. Let's talk about stigma for a bit. I've listed a variety of stigma definitions. Stuttering involves all of these types of stigma. I wanna to point to you the work of Michael Boyle, whose excellent research demonstrates that adults who stutter are at risk for health issues associated with stress related to both psychological well-being and physical health. And also encourage you to attend Hope Gerlach's presentation tomorrow talking about her research in concealment and psychological health, and psychological health issues. As a clinician, I'm struck by the enormous impact of self-stigma on my clients, affecting their attitudes about communication and their progress in therapy. Self-stigma is the internalization or buying into negative beliefs related to stigma. A famous quote from Groucho Marx is a wonderful illustration of self-stigma. I don't want to belong to any club that would accept me as one of its members. And this one from one of my clients who happens to be in a very high position. I wouldn't hire me in my position. Many of my clients compare stuttering to a physical disability, believing that it might be easier if the world could see the difference. It could be that the absence of visual markers for stuttering also contribute to stigma. 
and that the person is acting in ways that violate social norms. Here above, I've listed some of the research related to stigma and stuttering and below stigma and autism. Stigma from stuttering results in health issues, stress, physical health, and satisfaction with it. Negative characteristics and stereotypes, for example, the person is non assertive, intense, and insecure, and impact related to goal attainment. Hope Gerlach's dissertation work, highlighted in blue, delves into the notion specifically of masking or concealment in her examination of stuttering as a concealable stigmatized identity. The research in stigma from autism points more often to masking or camouflaging one's identity, leading to mental health issues. We need to follow Hope's lead and focus on the impact of masking when we look at life impact from stuttering. Yes, stigma leads to masking and suppression of stuttering, and this impacts quality of life. I believe this is the basis for all struggle, physical struggle, emotional struggle, and struggle with one's identity. Suppression of anticipated or actual feelings of loss of control may perhaps be the first attempt at masking, leading to reactivity, holding back, or actual disfluency. I wanna point you to the work of Seth Tischner and Scott Yars for an excellent discussion of perceived loss of control in their 2019 article in JSLHR. Secondary escape behaviors allow the stutterer to seemingly hide over its struggle in an attempt to mask. Word and situational avoidance will assure the stutterer of camouflaging their stuttering identity. And facing each day with the hope of fluency, enacting the false role of fluent speaker perpetuates the identity conflict. This is a redo of slide 15. Yes, stigma leads to masking and suppression of stuttering and this impacts quality of life. I believe this is the basis for all struggle, physical struggle, emotional struggle, and struggle with one's identity. Suppression of anticipated or actual feelings of loss of control may be perhaps the first attempt at masking, leading to reactivity, holding back, or actual disfluency. I want to point you to the work of Seth Titchener and Scott Yars for an excellent discussion of perceived loss of control in their 2019 article in JSLHR. Secondary escape behaviors allow the stutterer to seemingly hide over disfluency in an attempt to mask. Word and situational avoidance will assure the stutterer of camouflaging their stuttering identity. And facing each day with the hope of fluency, enacting the false role of fluent speaker perpetuates the identity conflict. Self-stigma starts very young and continues through life. I had three clips to show you, but decided not to include them because we're presenting this online. But I wanna tell you about them. The first shows a young woman talking about her earliest notion that stuttering was bad. She describes watching herself on her parents' home movie, reciting the ABCs at the age of two. She was struck at her stopping at the anticipated fluency on R and she gave up. And she watches her dad prompt her that the next letter was R. Even then she knew it was better to pretend not to know it. The next clip was a young man whose father, who also stuttered, told him how lucky they were that their stuttering wasn't as bad as the other kid on the baseball team. He explains that he knew from that point on, he had to hide it. The third was an emotional clip of an adult talking about her first stuttering evaluation in school when she was young. The speech pathologist made her read and struggled for the first time in front of someone. The speech pathologist played it back on the tape recorder, 
counting disfluencies. This little girl knew from that point on, she would never allow anyone to see it again. But stuttering is neurological and genetic. Yes, it's a neurodevelopmental disorder. Even though that we know that the lived experience of stuttering has more to do with how stutterers think and feel about stuttering and react to it. Could struggle, life impact and problems related to stuttering be eliminated if there were no efforts to mask and conceal? Can we make the case for embracing neurological differences to the point where there was no desire to hide? People are neurodivergent when they diverge from the dominant standards of normal. Are stutterers neurodivergent? Furthermore, let's consider if stutterers are a neurominority. The definition of neurominority includes people share a similar form of neurodivergence. It is innate and inseparable from who they are. And the majority tends to respond to them with some degree of prejudice or misunderstanding. Perhaps yes. And when we talk about neurominorities, we might consider some of the power imbalances that follow. Let me introduce you to the double empathy problem, credited to autistic scholar Damian Milton. Professionals have characterized autistics as having impaired theory of mind, the ability to imagine the feelings and thoughts of others in order to comprehend and predict their behavior. It is also called perspective taking and can explain to neurotypical people why an autistic does not provide relevant background information when telling a story, does not understand sarcasm, does not provide nonverbal cues to let the other one know they don't understand, does not repair communication when it breaks down, and most importantly, does not appears to not have any empathy. As speech pathologists, we try to teach autistics to improve perspective taking so they can understand the neurotypical mind because that one is better. It is on the autistic to figure us out. Let's imagine the autistic child during the Sally and Ann task. Hmm, is Sally thinking that the marble is in the basket or in the box? Isn't it more important to know where the marble really is? I know where it really is. This person wants to know where Sally thinks it is, but I couldn't give a hoot about marbles because I'm much more interested in Minecraft. But the so-called deficit in empathy goes both ways. The neurotypical individual does not have the ability to imagine how the autistic mind might work, but there's no expectation that they should. People with different ways of experiencing the world will struggle to empathize with each other. And furthermore, there is an imbalance of power with the neuromajority having the right perspective. Let's apply this to stuttering. We have a problem of double misunderstanding, which also leads to an imbalance of power. The stutterer talks differently. We have a list of deficits that account for it. So we need to teach stutterers to talk more like neurotypical speakers to improve their communication with people with normal speech. But there's little expectation that the neurotypical speaker should try to understand stuttering to improve their communication with stutterers. We ask very little of them. All we ask is don't fill in and don't mock. And they don't even do that. We need to do more, especially us, the professional community. Why? Because this power imbalance leads to ableism, discrimination in favor of non-disabled people. How do we as speech pathologists and researchers unknowingly contribute to ableism through our language, our choice of goals, our teaching strategies, or our missions? After learning about the double empathy problem, I asked my students to come up with some examples. They nailed it. <laughs> These are from them. Informing the stutterer how their stuttering pattern negatively impacts communication 
but not teaching the stutterer to inform listeners how their reactions negatively impact communication. Modeling fluency strategies for the stutterer, but unwilling to voluntary stutter because that would be cultural appropriation. Praising stutterers who mask their identity. You sound so great, so fluent. And by doing so, deprive the listener of the opportunity to connect joyfully with a stutterer and reduce stigma. Asking research questions that supposedly matter, but including stutterers as subjects, not collaborators. We have a long way to go towards equality, but now let's focus on our language and get to my real pet peeves, double messages and contradictions. I'll start with my favorite story because it is an exchange I had with an experienced speech pathologist, a colleague who felt pretty good about her treatment approaches for stutterers. I was talking about how I no longer teach the dichotomy of fluency shaping and stuttering modification in my stuttering courses because they actually perpetuate ableist attitudes towards stutterers. My colleague. Well, it makes perfect sense to me. You use fluency shaping to prevent stuttering and you use stuttering modification to get out of stuttering. Me? Uh, that sounds like a lot of suppression and escape from stuttering. Is stuttering a bad thing? Colleague, not at all. I always tell my clients that it's okay to stutter. I do a lot of work in that area. So with that introduction, and the caveat that we are all guilty, here's a list of my favorite double messages and contradictions. It's okay to stutter. Let's read about these famous people who stutter. Then we will practice some of your fluency targets. You need to show your stutter openly and you will need to manage your stuttering in some way throughout your life. Face your fears, it's okay to feel fear. Do some voluntary stuttering so you won't feel fear. Step out of your comfort zone, but be resilient. Struggle in front of others. Nobody really cares. Once you can control your stuttering, you can be spontaneous. And my favorite, my very own guilty pleasure, stutter with abandon, stutter well. We're all guilty. Shame is good, guilt is bad. No, okay, I'll stop, I won't do any more. Part of the problem is that some of us are unaware of our neurotypical empathy issues, and we want stutterers to speak more like us. Even some speech pathologists who stutter value the neuromajority's perspective. Look, we can't say the words, it's okay to stutter without believing it. It comes down to acceptance and self-acceptance. So let's get to acceptance and change and whether they're compatible or not. Some who resonate with the social model believe we should not be treating stuttering, but environmental accommodations alone will not eliminate all difficulties experienced by stutterers. Both societal changes and therapy may be needed. The issue is what will therapy look like in a social model? I have some quotes from Patrick Dwyer, an autistic researcher at the Mind Institute in California. On the subject of the compatibility of change and the social model, to quote Patrick, we don't really need to call someone deficient or disordered to change them. We simply need to recognize that it would help them thrive, be happy, and enjoy better mental well being if they possess some skills. On the topic of what to change, Cure and treatment are not the same. Important outcomes include improved quality of life, self-determination, and inclusion of neurodivergent people across the lifespan. To quote Patrick, I think we need to have a serious and open conversation about what sorts of intervention targets are appropriate and what sorts of targets are inappropriate. And this conversation obviously needs to include autistic people. We as professionals, have the power to change things. To quote Patrick, 
We can misuse the power by targeting things that can't be changed. And we can misuse it by targeting things we shouldn't be changing. One more comparison related to goals. Autistics and stutterers may have some things in common, what they want. And this may support the need for cross-neurotype cross alliance building. Our own Chris Constantino contributed to the chapter referenced below. Let's think about common connection. The goal for many autistics, common our head and bodies and connection with others. To participate joyfully in meaningful activities, we may appear different to others because there are differences. The goal for many stutterers, calm in our head and in our body, same thing, to say what we want, when we want, spontaneously, to communicate confidently and meaningfully with others. We may appear different to others because our speech is disfluent. What are some basic treatment ideas? First, start with a strength-based assessment. Ask questions that help clients identify their strengths, their knowledge, their proficiencies, their skills, and their talents. These will be key in helping them achieve their goals. Encourage them to seek opportunities for change and take risks. Next, celebrate new ideas of success. To say all they want spontaneously. Share joy and connection and communication. Letting others in your box be the ones who get it. Express their true personality, humor, sensitivity, opinions. Tell stories, jokes, things that don't need to be told. Share their stuttering with their listeners because it is a part of who they are. Feel confident as an equal communication partner. There's a saying, choose your hard. You've heard it. Losing weight is hard, being overweight is hard, choose your hard. Help your clients make informed choices without judgment from you. Neither is right or wrong. Here's some examples of choose your hard. Show up or stay home. Speak or remain silent. Reveal your stuttering identity or pass as fluent. Approach or avoid, risk or retreat, participate or hold back, stutter openly and honestly or escape, stutter spontaneously or control stuttering, feel shame or feel isolated, give others permission to think what they think or control the thoughts of others. One of my clients gave me the inspiration for these last two. He always says, hope is not what, what it's cracked up to be, never hope. So for him, be proactive or hope for the best. He also said of himself, it wasn't that I couldn't open stutter. It was that I was unwilling to. So the last one, be unwilling or be unable. So what about that overt stuttering behavior? Identity does not need to include learned struggle. Acceptance does not need to include acceptance of learned escape and reactivity. Help your clients let go of things. Let go of secondary behaviors that represent relics of old escape. Let go of efforts to control or manage the form of disfluency. Let go of self-imposed time pressure that leads to tension. Let go of strategies and techniques that distract from connection and let go of fluency as a meaningful attribute. From my perspective, the therapeutic process must lead to acceptance. These seven activities take place within the individual, but also within the family in the larger circle of support, the school, the workplace, the community and society as a whole. Within a medical model, we would be expecting the stutterer to become educated, to increase awareness, to advocate for themselves, to seek out support community, 
to redefine the idea of success with regard to communication, to make hard choices, and to embrace the identity of stutterer. Within the social model, we are expecting that society do the same kinds of things, increase awareness, become educated, advocate for others, connect through support, etc. We need to change the power dynamics so that there is no longer a double empathy problem. The burden is not on the neuro minority, but on society to redefine success, and it's not fluency. We as a society must focus on reducing stigma. Research on anti-stigma strategies have identified a variety of methods to be helpful. Education, dispelling myths, for example, protest, responding to injustices with anger and correction, societal contact, social contact with the stigmatized person, and self-disclosure. However, live interpersonal contact stands out as the most effective. I believe we should value support communities limited to single neuro minorities, but also value inclusive communities where neuro minorities gather with neurotypicals, families, friends, allies, community members. Yes, even speech pathologists who don't stutter. So what do treatment outcomes look like within the social model? Within society, we need knowledge, acceptance, equality, understanding, accommodation, and contact. The stutterer can learn to achieve efficiency and comfort in disfluency and confidence and spontaneity in communication. Joshua St. Pierre from the University of Alberta recently said, stuttering is a shared experience between communication partners. Thank you, Joshua. <laughs> And so is a dance, and we must each give weight equally. There's me in the blue in the middle. Joshua made me think of my dance community, which has abandoned traditional gender roles. For example, ladies and gents, leaders and followers. All invite others to dance. The mottos are, dance with who's coming at you, accept the unaccepted, unexpected, and take care of those around you. We could apply those mottos to communication. Some final thoughts, back to my optimism. As we leave 2020, I leave you with my vision of the future. Speech pathologists will no longer be delivering double messages to their clients. It's okay to stutter, but that was really fluent. Parents will no longer interrupt the funny, insightful, creative story their child is telling them with use your tools because their speech pathologist won't be handing out tools like tickets to Disneyland. Our research community will be less interested in asking questions that search out the deficits among stutterers, but will be asking those questions that seek to reduce stigma and barriers for those who are different to identify evidence-based strategies to improve the quality of life, self-determination, and inclusion of neurodivergent people. Our diversity committees will no longer be limited to topics related to culture, race, and gender, but will include neurodiversity as well. Our national professional organization will no longer be focused on the big nine disorders and instead focused perhaps on the big nine barriers, blocking the way of confidence, connection, and communication for those with differences, conditions, impairments, and disabilities. A few more thoughts as we go forward. Microaggressions against those who are neurodiverse will be recognized. I experienced one this week. Is he autistic? My response, smiling uncomfortably like we do with all microaggressions. No, he's Andrew. Two more final thoughts. Speech length pathologists will no longer label the parents of neurodiverse children as in denial and will recognize how they can support a parent who may be worried, in pain, or confused. And finally, success in therapy 
will no longer be based on looking neurotypical, but on developing self-advocacy and pride in one's identity, confidence, and, effective and effectiveness in communication. Thank you.